All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is um, Ask Me Anything live stream. So, I've yeah, we're doing this to celebrate. Um, well, basically, many of you guys, all of you, celebrate all of you, uh, and uh, just answer some questions that you sent over to me or that you might ask me in chat. So feel free to just send them over anytime, any moment. I'll be more than happy to answer any of those that you send, basically. Hey, Euro Budget Game. <laughs> I'm already screwing this up. Hi, Euro Budget. Why is it so hard to say? Hello, Eurogamer. You know what? I'm going to drop the budget word because somehow I cannot read that together. <laughs> My apologies, but <laughs> it is too hard for me. Uh, hey, Mehmatrix, welcome to the stream. Yes, I am doing I'm fine, I guess. I mean, I've been quite tired today for some reason. I guess too many meetings in the morning, uh, you know, having their toll. But uh, yeah, I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Um, okay, I guess, yeah, so I have, uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions uh, that have been sent to me prior to the stream. I guess we could just start with them. And then if you guys have anything else you want to ask, we can just, uh, I mean, you feel free, as I said, you know, feel free to throw those questions into the chat over when I'm talking, basically, we'll be more than happy to answer those. I'll just add them to the list, I guess. Uh, hey, Mandaputra, welcome to the stream. Uh, yes, beers. Beers are waiting for me in the fridge. That is indeed a good idea. <laughs> Might be something that I would actually want to do after this stream. Uh, yeah, doing good, man. Um, and I uh, hope you're doing well as well. But okay, let us um, start from with the questions, I guess, right? So the first question we got here, I honestly, I should have probably written down who sent me the questions. So if you recognize your question and you know, it's you, so I'm sorry, I forgot to write down the names, okay? <laughs> I'm just really bad at this, apparently. I haven't even thought about that, so I probably should have written the question and the name of the person asking, but you know what, for now, we're just gonna go with the questions. So the first question we got here is, where are you from and where do you live now? Well, that's, um, that's relatively easy to show. So we can start with where I'm from. I'm actually from Russia originally, and uh, I've been living there until 20, I was like 22 years old or 23 years old or something. And my hometown is Murmansk over here. So if we take this um, the city, it is all the way on the north and it is incredibly chill in the winter. We get like minus 35 degrees is something that you typically have. And uh, there is the polar day and polar night there, basically meaning that during the night you don't see this, uh, sorry, during the winter you don't see the sun at all. And during the summer, sun never sets. And that is kind of the uh, considered to be normal there. So this is where I lived for 23 years of my life. <laughs> then I've been basically getting the university, um, studying in university in St. Petersburg and then traveling between St. Petersburg and Moscow for work. And now I am actually living in Germany in the city of Leipzig, which is just a bit to the south from Berlin over here. I have too many markers on my map. And uh, yes, I have basically did my PhD here and remains to work. But um, I guess that answers it, right? So we can kill this one. So the next question we got here. Why, when did you start programming? Uh, this is probably the silliest one ever. There is this movie called Hackers. I think it's from 1995. Yeah, this is when I started programming. I was, what, seven, eight years old? Eight years old. So I saw this movie and I was like, this looks amazing. I like, I know that it's completely fake. And even at that moment, I understood enough about computers to know that all of the stuff that they shown is absolutely fake. But the whole, you know, the idea behind the movie, the idea that if you know how those machines work, you can literally do anything. It just fascinated me to no end. And this was basically the moment when I knew that, okay, I'm going to be a software developer. I'm going to hack things. And I came from, you know, from <laughs> trying to hack stuff and being terrible at that, going to the, you know, starting with assembly and going to C, going to... Uh, I don't even remember, like I've tried so many languages in my time and uh, yes, all the way to JavaScript and web development. So when this 1995 and uh, for how long this was going to be now, 20, 25, I mean, it's nearly 25 years now, if you count all of those years, it's like 24 years, but 
Obviously, I wasn't doing it professionally until quite, quite much later. I think my first professional gig I got was like freelancing to build some websites for the local businesses, which is, I think, what majority of people started back in the late 90s. And at the time I was 16 or so. So overall, I've been programming for no, wait, I was older. I was like 18, maybe. So I basically have like about 15 years of professional experience with software development. And it was ranging from anything starting with, uh, you know, basic websites in HTML and a bit of DHTML is what it was called back then. Dynamic HTML and Perl scripts. Yeah, that brings back memories. Um, and then I switched to programming in Java. I did some desktop apps with that. Then I switched to ActionScript 3 and Flash websites. And I did some mini games and interactive content. Then there was C Sharp with uh, Xamarin uh, for the mobiles. Back then it was called Monotouch. There was PHP for quite some time. This is actually how I landed my PhD position. I've spent uh, three months doing internship uh, with the research group that I'm working at now. And I've programmed basically in PHP for about a year, if not more, for some research projects that worked out quite well. I mean, it's not the best language, but it's not terrible. And uh, then there was, so yeah, C Sharp I already mentioned. There was Python, obviously. The data science is all about Python nowadays. And then I discovered Node.js when it was released, like I think a year after it was originally released. And uh, since that time, I've been coding JavaScript about 90% of my time, occasionally delving into the Golang and other stuff, which is also quite fun. But yeah, I guess that basically answers it. Next question I got here is, do you have a degree in computer science? Do you think it's important? Uh, I do have a degree. I actually have a diploma or master thesis, basically a master um, MCS, God damn it, master science in uh, electronical engineering. So my first uh, d diploma or my first degree is actually in telecommunications engineering. So I'm a, I'm a telecoms engineer and I spent five years in Russia studying how does the cellular networks work? How does the normal networks work? How does the encryption on the networks work? You know, all the hardware that you can imagine, we had some insane stuff going on there. So actually my first degree is not computer science related, although we had like two or three courses of computer science. Uh, and yeah, I predominantly studied hardware and that was, I mean, I'm not very good at that. I know how it works. I know how to read schematics. I even know how to solder stuff and did quite a few hardware mods myself. And I enjoyed that, but I'm really bad at that. Um, and after that, I somehow landed a PhD in computer science uh, because, you know, that was the field that I was enjoying. And I was looking, uh, <laughs> I was looking to move away from Russia. I will address this question in a second. So I was looking for a way to move away from Russia because at the, at the point it was like, in Russia, you have the obligatory uh, army service. So, you know, when you graduate from university, you have to spend two years in an army or one year if you go into special forces. And I've seen what happened to my older friends that went there. And it was not like, it's literally, I had one of my friends who came back after the army service and he spent first three months lying on a bed and staring in the ceiling just because it was so boring in the army. They didn't do anything else. And he was like, you know, I'm fine with that. I was like, okay, yeah. He, get, he got better after that. So basically we dragged him out and uh, make him feel better. But after looking at that, I decided that I don't want to go to the service. And one of the ways to evade that was to get a um, degree, basically, you know, like the uh, PhD. Well, Russian PhD is a weird thing that was like, okay, so you have to work in university for eight hours. We will pay you, I think at a time it was like uh, 40 euro. That was per month, that was nothing just so that you know it's it's equally nothing right now and then you have to in addition to working eight hours in university you have to actually do your phd like publish the papers and write your thesis and you know do research and i was like that does not sound fun so i started looking for programs outside of russia and i landed a position in germany which paid um i, I think my stipend originally was like 750 euro which was about seven times better <laughs> So yes, basically I somehow landed a PhD in computer science and do I think it's, if it's important, um, kinda, 
like is here's the thing it, it highly depends on what you're gonna do so if you're just gonna be a web developer who builds the websites and web servers you're likely not gonna need computer science you're gonna be completely fine without it there is no need to have in-depth understanding of all the processes that happen in the background and you're gonna be fine right but if you really want to specialize in something on a very you know low level and to be really be like one of those world renowned experts let's put it this way i think computer science will help you a lot like you can still pull it off without it but you will just basically have to study majority of stuff yourself so no it's not really important but if you want to be an expert then yeah you, you kind of have to uh, learn it anyway so um, that's my answer and to answer your question did you do your practice at lubyanka no i didn't <laughs> so lubyanka is actually in moscow and i was studying in saint petersburg um i actually have a few um mates from university who ended up working for the FSB. They are now working, I mean, at least when I left the country, they were working in the cyber crime, like cybersecurity units. And uh, well, they were saying actually quite nice and they're quite professional people there. So I was surprised to be honest, but uh, there you go. <laughs> um, I'll thought, you know, I don't know, I would probably never work for Russian uh, law enforcement and Russian like military and stuff like this, because it is, I mean, so here's here's another story for you. When I was in a Russian university, there was another way actually of me not going to the army. We had a called so-called military uh, division in the university where you could sign up and then one of your semesters, instead of doing your normal studies, you just go and do the military stuff. It was, since we was the telecom guys, we had to do like one semester of military telecom hardware, right? So they, they showed us the top secret documents and taught us how the military hardware works. Um, it is an absolute shit show. First of all, because all of their top secret military hardware documents were easily found on the internet. This was the most amusing episode. I still remember the part when uh, one of the guys who was with me, he just found the uh, manual for one of the devices online, printed the whole thing out and brought it with him to show the professors who were there. The, guy, the professors, they are like, they are kind of like professors, but they also have like the military ranking. So I think one of them was like the uh, high ranking officer who was doing the secret document stuff. And we had the whole procedure going, you know, you come in and they're like, okay, so you have to like turn off all your mobile phones, put them in this special box that isolates them and don't tell anyone what we're doing here. And then this guy just takes out his backpack and puts out this printed document that is supposed to be secret. You should have seen the face of this professor. He was insane. He was like, where did you get that? He was like, I'll just download it online. It was the most amusing thing I've ever seen. It was, yeah, I, I've, like, it was crazy. Uh, I basically, I think I've, I've managed to be there for like a month. After that, I got tired of those people screaming at me on any occasion because, you know, it's like your typical military, pretty much like the uh, Full Metal Jacket, for example, is a great example of this guy who just screams at everyone. It is exactly the same. I was like, nope, screw this. I'm not going to just beer with that. I'm just going to, you know, go back to my studies and figure something out later on. And I just left. And uh, yeah, so this it's oh boy. OK, it's not <laughs> it's yeah. Um, so let me just have a quick look at the chats. Tuition reimbursement. Oh, that's a real, like, uh, this never is there. Uh, so like the tuitions and stuff like this, it was never a problem in Russia and it is not a problem in Germany for which I'm really grateful. Like in Russia, you always have the paid option, but it, it's not even close to the, you know, paid options that you have like in the US, for example. So I think I ended up doing the paid uh, option, but we paid like, 500 uh, US dollars per semester. So it was like nothing, you know, you just go take a part-time job and you're covered. And I had support of my parents, so it was even easier than that. Uh, for those in, yeah, Lubyanka, yeah, Lubyanka is the headquarters of KGB and FSB and they still have the offices there, I think. So it's, uh, yeah, as I said, you know, uh, some of the guys who studied with me, they went on to work in FSB for the cybersecurity unit and it seems they're quite fine with that. I don't know. I personally, um, I could say, yeah, I could say I despise everything about the Russian current regime. So I would not work there just out of the political um, sense, basically. But okay, uh, let us continue. 
So next thing we got here is the question from uh, one of our Discord people. Again, I forgot to write down your usernames. I'm really sorry, guys, but um, I'm just going to go through it. I'm building my blog and I want to analyze user interaction with the content. And I have my own analytics server with the data being sent of scroll haste reaching 25, 50 and 100 percent. Is there a better way to do it? Um, so here's the deal. That highly, so the thing is that just um, sending the data based on the scroll height is not very helpful. Like, first of all, I, t I have this uh, thing when I open the pages, I tend to just scroll randomly and then be like, okay, you know, that looks interesting. So I'm just going to go back and try to read it carefully from the beginning, right? So I just skim through the article essentially, but that doesn't mean I'm going to finish it. So the scroll height is not exactly illustrative of the reading. The second thing is that someone might use an add-on that does the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like the readability mode or whatever, right? That just does it in a nicer way. And then they don't scroll your page, they just use the add-on. So that's not going to work. Uh, I think we already talk, uh, talked about this, but you said you already do the time tracking, which will improve this measure a bit because, you know, it will depend basically on how long the user spends on the page. So you can kind of assume that he spent this time reading the thing. But uh, here's the deal. You can, like, this This will only give you bare bones metric F as to how long did the user spend on the page, right? And this will not actually paint a real picture for you because the main, the main so sort of the most important question here you have to answer is what do I want to track? Like, do I want to track what kind of the articles user is interested in, right? Or do I want to track how long does the user engage with the article or do you want to track if the users like those articles? So that's basically you have to define the set of questions that you want to answer. Maybe users, maybe you want to know if the users like your articles, then the best way would be to just ask them. So put the buttons at the end of the article that say, I really like that or I dislike that and make them press it, right? And if they press it, you will have a way better uh, understanding of what exactly uh, basic, oh, bleh, let me try this again. You will have a better understanding of the statistics that answer your questions. Yes, majority of the users will not bother pressing them. Yes, it might annoy some of the users if you do it wrong, but this is gonna be a better statistics than just some arbitrary time or scroll hates that might not work at all. Um, I would actually suggest going to the um, Scholar Google search and uh, searching for measuring engagement on the web or something similar, because there is a ton of studies done on this topic. I've actually read, uh, read some of them during my PhD thesis because I had to do like UI UX testing for one of my projects. And there is a lot of really good existing models and approaches to do this. So you can just, you know, skim through them, find the ones that you think will work for you and just reuse that because you don't have, you, you, like you don't actually have to invent anything. There's already a bunch of tested, well-proven approaches that work on, even for major companies, I think there's like papers from IBM and whatnot, you know, so just, just look through that and you will find the answer. Uh, I, I'm not exactly an expert in this, so I did it like twice or thrice with my projects, but um, yeah, I would <laughs> basically suggest looking into the prior work to uh, help you out. Okay, uh, let me see the chat. Did they work at a troll farm screwing with the US elections? I think those guys are actually non-related to the uh, cyber... Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me try this again. I think those guys are not related to cybersecurity uh, like divisions in FSB and stuff like this. So they, they are literally like anti-crime stuff. And uh, the troll farms is a commercial initiative. So it's literally, it's companies. Uh, at least uh, this is my understanding from what I read. So they literally made like a Russian version of startups. They do this for money. And prim primary, uh, why am I so bad today? Primarily, the money come from the Russian government for, you know, screwing with the Russian media and Russian media landscape, but then they use the same approaches for the US elections, it seems. Uh, but those are not the sort of the Russian law enforcement or anything like this. They are literally private guys who just know how to run this stuff. I'm not even sure if the, uh, you know, FSB and people like this would, uh, would know enough about the whole psychological aspects to be effective at this.
So this is a very specifically crafted company that can do this basically. You have very little Russian accent. How did you get practicing your English? Um, I've learned English from playing video games. I've, I think I've already mentioned it once or twice, but I've initially I learned English when I played Fallout 1 and 2. So I actually got them on uh, discs in Russian and uh, the way it was translated, they just took the game, they exported all the text files, then they put them into the automated translation. Bear in mind, this was 1994? What was it? For when was the first Fallout came out? Uh, 1997, okay, 1997. So this was 1997 and the automated translation was absolute garbage. So I, w I played Fallout 1, I got through first two or three quests. It was absolutely fascinating. I was just enchanted by the world and I wanted to finish it. But then there was this dialogue with the next quest that was a key to you know the progression. It was so poorly translated, I could not figure out what the shit do they want me to do. <laughs> So I actually had to basically sell this disc I had, go find the English version and play it with a dictionary, trying to figure out what the hell's going on and how to actually proceed through that. I finished the first and the second games with the dictionary and after that I basically could read just about everything. And I mean, you know, knowing the Fallout um, texts, you can imagine what kind of things I had to go through. There was no Wikipedia, there was no online translators back then, there was no, there was like the automated translation was garbage. So I literally had to just sit there with a the dictionary and go through it word by word to try and make sense of it. Uh, my accent, I honestly have no idea why I'm speaking the way I do. I, I watched, like since I've uh, learned the English, I started watching a lot of media uh, in English. So I prefer the English TV shows, I prefer the English movies, like in English, so without translation. It's as easy for me to now to watch them as it is in Russian. So I just, you know, why not watch it in the original version? I guess I just somehow picked it up from there, but I could not answer that better. Uh, first bootleg CD games was the Fallout 1 in English with all the sounds and animations ripped. That sounds very familiar. I think it was the same for me. <laughs> okay, um, let me have a look there. Do you read some programming books? What do you recommend? Are you EPUB people or hardcover? So I haven't, uh, like I used to read a lot of books when, uh, let me put this, let me put it this way. I used to read a ton of books before my PhD studies, when I was basically trying to figure out, uh, you know, what, what do I want to do with my programming career? Do I want to go into the web development? Do I want to go into the desktop development? Do I want to specialize in, uh, I think machine learning wasn't even a thing back then. And I used to read a ton of books like I had back in St. Petersburg when I was in university, I had a bookshelf with insane amount of programming books. It was like three or four, uh, no wait, so I'm lying. There was about three meters height and like one and a half meter wide. All of that was software development books and a bit of like other stuff. Um, nowadays, I don't remember when was the last time I read the books because I typically pick up the new ones because we usually have access to them in university. You can just go either in library or just order it through the um, special way basically we have for the, you know, for the PhD students. That is way very easy. You can just ask them, they will bring it to you. You can just skim through it and look if it's interesting. And this is what I typically do. I just skim. I see that majority of questions answered there is something that I already know. I go like, okay, you know what, fine. I'm just gonna come back to it when I want more specific answers. So I, I basically, I stopped reading books as a reading material and I started using them as a reference material. So I know that, okay, there are these books and this book will answer questions when I have them about, I don't know, SEO. This book will answer the questions when I have about the high loads and stuff like this. Uh, recommending, I would recommend uh, reading, like there's a couple of books that I think are absolutely worth reading, like the ones that I've read, again, quite some time ago. One of them would be Clean Code. It is really interesting. So again, I would not, I don't think I follow everything that the book outlines, but again, the book itself doesn't say that it's an absolute rules, right? So it is absolutely fascinating and it does changes the way that you think about writing your code. It's, it's a really great book. And I would like, if, if I would recommend one thing, then it would be it. Other than that, I would, I guess I would just have to look at the, my list of books to actually remember what the hell I could recommend. 
Um, and yes, uh, as, as much as I used to buy hardcover books and I order them, you know, in a library or whatever, uh, nowadays, if I actually would buy something myself or rent it, I would go for Amazon Kindle or, you know, ebook in any format, essentially, because then I can just take a book reader or my phone and just read it there because it's been quite a while since I read a paper book in the last, I don't know, five years or something. So the majority was um, ebooks. Um, all right. Let us see what else do we have. Question. What made you start Twitch YouTube? Um, I've <laughs> so here's the thing. I've actually started as a gaming YouTuber, if you would believe. I, I think my channel is even is even there. It was I was like, okay, so there's this um, new uh, early access genre, right? Or early access games. There's been like a ton of them. And I was like, okay, I can I can review those. I was actually quite inspired by the Tunnel Biscuit. Uh, rest in peace, his soul. He's he was amazing inspiration to me. I was like, you know, I want to do the same. But for early access games, because he never, he was like, I, I won't touch the very early games because I don't think they're finished and it's fair to review them. I was like, you know, I can do first impressions on them and maybe do the updates for them once the major things change. So I did that. I was doing that for about a year, I guess. No, two years. Okay. And there was like, yeah, it was some videos. It was, it was not even close to being popular. Like I had... I think at the at the top I had like 700 subscribers. You know, people don't care about yet another guy talking about video games. And at some point I was like, um, oh yeah, right. So there was the thing I've uh, I typically uh, we have students who work with us, either PhD students or master students, and I have to sometimes teach them things. Sometimes it's the things about web servers, and at some point I get tired of repeating the same stuff over and over again. And I was like, okay, I'll just do a video series and put it on YouTube. And then if they keep asking the same questions about Docker, about Git or whatever, I can just say, hey, here's a YouTube video, go have a look, right? And I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do it on my personal channel. I'm not gonna do it on gaming channel, obviously. And uh, then I just went to Reddit and I was like, hey guys, I'm doing this thing. And it just blew up somehow. Like. You know, for me, it looks like it blew up because I gained like a few thousand subscribers uh, just from one Reddit post. And it was like insane response. And I think I still think like one of my first series is still one of the best. And uh, then I just, yeah, slowly I understood that, you know, having two YouTube channels is a bit too much for me and trying to do two things at the same time, like gaming and programming uh, is a bit too hard because, you know, if you want to do game reviews, you actually have to play games, then prepare the text record the video, edit it, it's a lot of pain in ass. Same goes for the software development and I don't have enough time to do the two of the things, uh, yeah. two of the things every week. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna merge the channels into one and then I'm gonna kind of split and do gaming occasionally and start doing the software a bit. And uh, yeah, it's been working out. I mean, I've actually discovered the streaming and found out that I really enjoy just sitting here talking to my, to myself essentially. And it's just much easier because I can just upload it afterwards to the YouTube and not spend four more hours editing it to be, you know, nice since I can just talk naturally, right? And it seems like people are happy enough with the quality. So that's, uh, yeah, that seems to be working out quite nicely. Uh, that's how I got started as well. Wanted to do a budget PC gaming channel. That actually sounds quite nice. To fairly successful video, yeah. I mean, it's really tough in a in. It's really tough in general. If you do it for views or money, you are not gonna make it. Like I did, I'm doing the JavaScript and I'm doing the games just because I, I bleh, just because I'm terrible at it. Because I enjoy uh, streaming. Essentially, I enjoy interacting with you guys in the chat. I would not like. I, I there's no way in a million years I would be able to live off of that. It's like I don't know how much time and money I would have to put into the channels and advertisement and promotion and everything to make it a viable, like, you know, way to sustain my life. This is, I, I don't feel like this is going to happen. Um, starting now with the front end dev channel. Uh, so I would just, yeah, one tiny advice from what I've tried. Don't do two channels at once. Just make one and make stuff that works way better. Like seriously. It's it's a huge overhead to do two things at once. Um, okay, right. Uh, 
yeah, giving back to community, practicing for public speaking, absolutely, all of that is really, really helpful. And even though, you know, I just sit here, speak to myself, it still helps me. And even like, I, I, I still screw up a lot of times, right? I still use, like, I still stretch my vowels and I still speak like shit and I still do it in terrible manners, but I'm getting better. And I think maybe in five years, I'll get a, just get to a point where I'm really good and I can record a videos in one take and I can speak perfectly on a podcast and everything, but uh, we'll see how that develops. I actually found me on Dev2. Well, Dev2 has been useful for something. It's, uh, it's such a weird website. It started out as a, such a nice small community, but now that there's so many people, it's basically turned into a, another version of Medium with less annoyances, which is still fine, you know, but it's not as, it doesn't feel as impactful as it used to be. I guess this is the way I would put it. But, you know, it's the same with all the communities. As they grow, they just feel a bit more saturated, I guess. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, let us continue with the questions. So these three questions we have here is from Mr. F Discus on Discord. I don't know if you're watching, mate, or not, but uh, we're going to go to your... Those questions are evil, by the way. I just wanted to know that they are absolutely evil. So the first one we have here is why do you still in your demos or simple... Uh, <laughs> can't even read that. Okay, why are you still in your demos or simple projects do not use TypeScript? I do not like TypeScript. Like I've tried it multiple times. I've seen it work in projects and I just, every time I try to use it personally, if it's the project that I start myself, I feel like instead of writing the productive code, I just fight with TypeScript and typings. You know, it, does, it doesn't make me feel uh, productive. It makes me feel like I have to fight with the typings first. And then once I'm done, I will actually write the useful code. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have run the TypeScript in a strict mode from the beginning, but this sort of was the best practice I found online. And I revisit it occasionally and every time it just feels cumbersome to me. Like I, I, I can see the value it can bring in the larger projects when you have a large team with a very diverse uh, team that you know has a very different levels of skill because TypeScript is very good at standardizing code, right? Because then the junior devs, it will be way harder for them to screw things up because there are typings to save them from a very simple issues, right? But I was lucky enough, I guess, to work, I, again, you know, I'm working in research and development. So majority of time teams that I work with consist of master students who are already quite experienced or PhD students who are even better. And even though their programming practices are not always like industry standard, they are smart people and they are really good. And majority of time, it, it, you're not required to have typings for them to write a good code, you know? Maybe this is the reason. But yeah, it's just, it feels... I am super grateful that TypeScript exists because the tooling it provides for VS Code for JavaScript is freaking amazing. But I just don't feel like it justifies all the hassle around it to, you know, actually use it in my projects, especially in the simple ones and especially in the demos because it's just so much overhead just to set up and then type everything. And it's just like, oh man, come on. I just want to write my code. Uh, but yeah, I might as well change my opinion when I start working with, uh, you know, industry projects that have like team of 50 people and 20 of them are junior devs. That might be a very different picture, but I just didn't have a chance to do that yet. I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, next thing we got here. Oh yeah, this one is the philosophical one. How you imagine the web will look like after 15 years? Will it not be as we do right now? Maybe it will transform to something like Internet of Things. Um, like 15 years is a long time actually. So here's the deal. <laughs> I think uh we th this is actually kind of related to the topic of my phd because i was working on the ubiquitous devices and i think that we are sort of very slowly going into the um sort of you know ubiquity and singularity of technology and right now so the first sort of step towards that was the iphones in 2007 they changed everything right so the smartphones they will never be the same as they were before without before the iphone essentially so the iphone changed the landscape i think the next big thing that would do the same shift is going to be ar so once we get the glasses that look exactly like normal glasses but they actually allow you to augment your reality 
and put things in front of your face, like the web pages and everything, this will cardinally change how the web looks, how it works, and how do we think about it? Because you know, right now when you get the phone, this is this is the thing that you have, right? So you can you can put the thing on the screen. You can okay, you have to adapt the web to be like. Uh, so we we had to change our thinking about the web development after the phones became smartphones became popular because of the different shapes of the phones and tablets, right? Uh, but here's the thing. Once we think about the augmented reality, it's no longer about the shape of the screen, but rather how would you perceive information if it was right in front of your face, right? And you kind of, we, I mean, we already have the virtual reality that is kind of in between, you know, the mixed reality and our reality, but it's still not quite uh, what I think the AR will be in the end. And even now in VR, if you ever tried something like Oculus or Vive or whatever, you know that the user interfaces that we have for the browsers and the web that we have right now, it doesn't work there. Like what the best you could do is you can show the surface that will look like a monitor, you know, to emulate what we have right now in a real world, but that's still not very convenient. The interfaces in VR work best when they are detached and disassembled essentially, right? You have different shapes in different places in front of you this is when it works best. And I think once AR really catches up, which I mean, we already have the amazing, uh, what was the name of it? The Microsoft headsets. Oh boy, uh, Microsoft AR, what was the name of it? HoloLens, right? So the HoloLens, they have the second generation now that looks absolutely mind blowing. Like, yes, this thing is big. Yes, this thing is expensive, but what it does is really crazy. If you ever tried one of those things in demo centers or anywhere, it is mind blowing what you can see there. Like, yes, okay, it's the, the FOV is small. Yes, the picture is, it requires you to be indoors and there's like some issues there, but it is still mind blowing. But once this is becomes accessible, once this becomes cheap, it's gonna change everything. And I think this is sort of the future. This is where the web will also head because everyone will have one of those. And this is gonna be just as widespread as the phones. And I mean, Internet of Things, yeah, kind of going to be on top of that, right? So this is the thing again. So once you get this AR uh, on your head, essentially, you can connect to any Internet of Things object and it can show you some interface right on top of it, for example, which is, uh, which is kind of crazy. Uh, you think AR will be bigger than VR? Absolutely. So the thing about v VR is that it's a very niche thing, right? So it's like you, uh, you put the helmet on. First of all, you need quite a lot of space. We have a, a separate room over there where, where we watch movies and we have a TV mounted to the wall. And it's about like two meters by two and a half meters. And that's still not enough space to comfortably play v VR, right? So I, I bought Oculus Quest recently. And if I would want to play it comfortably, I need like five by five meters or something. You need a ton of space to do that in a nice way. AR, on the other hand, it works on top of what you already have, so it doesn't care about uh, restrictions, right? So it, should, it works around them. And because AR doesn't interfere, so once you put the VR helmet on, you're basically cut off from the real world, right? You, you no longer know what happens outside you. And this is like my wife spooked me more than once when I was playing games like this. Uh, and this is the cool thing about VR, right? You can literally transfer into another reality, but the AR doesn't have this restriction. You can use it everywhere. You can put glasses on and you can like do something while walking around or put the video call on top of your working monitor so that your Skype won't occupy the space. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely like the utility is insane in, in my opinion. This is at least what I have in my hand, uh, head. But yeah, so this is kind of the thing. Uh, let me have the question earlier. Um, hey, Blaze, uh, welcome to the stream. Let me read your question real quick. I have a question. I'm in a code bootcamp and I have to build a battleship game in a console using Python. Do you have any tips how to set up the functions and stuff for the beginner? Um, if you're a beginner, don't think too much about how to set up stuff, how to do it nicely. Just, um, just write it. So make it work first. I think my, my, my absolutely favorite rule for programming, and it's been for quite some time, is you know this three stages rule. Make it work, make it fast, and then make it right. No, sorry, <laughs> I'm messing it up. Make it work, then make it right, and make it fast. So this is the three stages you do. So first, first of all, you have to make it work somehow. 
If it works and if it does what you want, you're good. Second of all, you take a look at your code, you take a look at what you've written and then you think, what can I do to make it better? What can I do to make it right? And then you rewrite it to structure it nicer, split it into functions, organize it better if you have time, right? And then if you have even more time, you can make it faster, you can make it more efficient, you can make it more, less memory intense and so on and so forth. So I would not stress about your structure and stuff like this, especially so if you're a beginner. So your main target should be to make it work. Everything else is absolutely secondary. And uh, this is still how I come to my, like approach my work as well. So I always start with like, okay, so I'm gonna throw in a prototype that works somehow. If it does the job, great. If it's not, then, you know, my assumptions were wrong and I will have to rethink them. If it does the job and I finished it and it works, then I will start thinking, how do I change the code? How do I rearrange it? How do I split it? How do I maybe create uh, separate libraries from what I have that may be useful to other people and stuff like this. But yeah, you know, I just wouldn't, wouldn't sweat it. Uh, just do whatever works for you. Okay, let me see. So yes, we answered that. What about voice services like Alexa, Siri or Cortana? Um, I like I, <laughs> I'm probably the wrong person to ask about that. So I think the only time I use my uh, Google Assistant is to set the timers, you know, just press a button like, hey, Google set timer for like five minutes for cooking. <laughs> but <laughs> I almost never ask. I feel like it's it's easier for me to just type. I maybe this will change once again. Uh, here's the point. When I play VR games, there's actually more than once already moments where I use the voice commands for the games that actually have them because it's not as convenient to do all this, you know, like manipulations with the hands and fingers and stuff like this because you don't have the keyboard, right? Yes, exactly. If you have keyboard, then typing is faster than talking. Not like I'm, I'm terrible at typing at mobile, but even then typing is faster than talking because sometimes Google doesn't understand what I'm saying because of my accent and other times there's a network issue. So it doesn't actually recognize my words and other time there's some Wi-Fi delay. So it takes a few more seconds to send the request than it would have if I just, you know, fired up the browser and send an HTTP request. So it's Maybe once the voice assistants get to the stage where they are nearly immediate, I will change my mind. But as of right now, again, you know, like the cases where I don't have access to my keyboard, absolutely, I would use them. They work quite nicely. But if I have access to the typing means, I, I would type 100% of the time. <laughs> okay, um, right. So we got um, last question here, which is also, I think it's... if. It's probably even trickier than the previous one, but uh, here we go. If you would be the NPM owner and got big investment for reworking the project, what would you change? How would it work? And how, you mo how would you monetize it? Oh boy, uh, this is a tricky one. So here's the deal. On one hand, um, what NPM does right now is in terms like, you know, I'm, I'm an open source user, right? So I'm pretty happy with it, it works fine. There was some problems with the package deletion and stuff like this, but they are kind of resolved, this is okay, right? So the problem they're having right now is monetizing it. So they have a problem hosting it because the hosting bills are insane because the package number grows, the downloads grows and so on and so forth. So what their monetization right now is, okay, we have NPM organization where you pay per user per month and you can publish private and scope packages, right? And you have enterprise. Uh, so they, ha they say they have this private registry hosting, but they don't actually say if it's, I, I imagine it's on premise, right? Because I feel like this has got to be the biggest thing that they could do that the easiest to achieve is to sell the on-premise NPM mirror because, I mean, this is an existing thing, right? There's this Synopia thing that's been around for a while and it's, uh, I think it's no longer Synopia actually. There's the, what was the name of it? There was the new one, uh, private MPM registry. Uh, Verdaccio, right, that was Verdaccio. It is insanely popular because there is a lot of corporate entities like enterprises and big companies that have strict security rules that you cannot have anything outside. You cannot pay for software as a service if it's not in intranet, right? So they install their own private registries like Verdaccio or there is the one that we used at my last job, 
uh, when I worked in uh, enterprise was Artifactory. This is like the artifact manager, but it comes with like NPM, Maven, Jenkins, Docker, like it has everything in it basically. It's quite convenient, but it's also expensive as hell. And it's a bit of a pain in the ass to use with NPM because of some, or at least it was at a time, I guess because they just started out. Um, and yeah, so I think the biggest thing they could do is create the hosted solution for enterprises that are looking to do this internally. At least this is what I would focus on. Like you would need to have an incredible sales team who would actually force the enterprises or to not force, force is the wrong word, sell them your solution over the other existing. So it has to have better benefits, better features, I guess, than others. But it's a really tough, like, it's a really tough thing. I don't know if they can survive off that. Like, it's, uh, business-wise, it is a super tricky question. And I'm sure they already thought about that. I'm sure they have the statistics that will absolutely blow out of water everything I have to say about that. But I imagine it is going to be very hard for them to cover the bills that they have right now. So I, it's, it's a really tricky one. And without knowing all the internals of the NPM and how they work, it's really hard to answer. But again, you know, I think in like, at least from my experience, I would focus on the enterprise part because those guys can shell out like thousands of dollars per month easily without even thinking about it just for the pilot projects. And if you can convince them and sign a contract, then it's going to be for like, you know, five, 10 years you hundred thousand per year and you're going to be okay ish depending on their bills that i mean it actually looks like this is exactly what they are doing right now so um okay let me see the chat what's your thoughts on entropies uh you mean the um entropic right was the name of it the uh, distributed uh federated package registry by the x npm cto I think that it has potential, but uh, so I have exactly the same gripe with all the distributed, federated, peer-to-peer uh, -peer services, like whatever you take, like there's the Mastodon, for example, that is supposed to be the Twitter replacement, right? Which actually is a pretty nice service. And I even have a Mastodon, was it a Chaos? Mastodon, Chaos. Uh, yeah, I think I have my uh, my note on Chaos Social, I believe. Um, yeah, that looks that looks correct. Yeah, I still uh, okay. I have my whatever. So I, I even have an account. But here's the problem. Uh, I think that the core problem with the federated and distributed services is discoverability. So the ease of use of npm is there because it's really easy for me to go to npmjs.org or yarnpackage.com or whatever and just search over here, right? And be like, hey, I'm actually looking for express cookies, right? And there's my 200 packages that will satisfy my query. Um, the thing is that majority of time when you take federated uh, things, doesn't matter if it's Mastodon, doesn't matter if it's Entropic, you don't have a convenient way of searching and navigating them. It's always a problem. It's a huge problem in federated uh, registries and federated social networks. How do you discover other interesting things if those nodes are not related at all? It's like, yes, they can talk to each other, but one node might not, not, any, might not know anything about the contents of other node, right? So how do I actually find what's interesting to me if there's like 25 different registries and I don't know about five of them. So I can go and manually search over 20, but then I'm missing the other five. I, it might fly, I, like I, I honestly haven't had time to check the um, Entropic to see if they actually address this in any way. Because uh, th like, again, this is, you know, this is not a problem that I just took on top of my head, this is actually something. So during my PhD studies, one of the projects we did was federated social network based on semantic web technologies. And it was really nice. You know, you could have, you could self host your own profile. And I think now it's actually transformed into web ID basically. If I remember, no, this is not the web ID I was talking about. Uh, web ID, there you go. It's now in W3C standard, or it's probably not a standard yet. But it's basically one of the, yeah, so WebID protocol based on FOV, yes, exactly. 
And the idea is that you can self-host your profile that anyone can reference. It's amazing. You can have your own posts. You can have links to your friends. But the thing is, once you publish this, there is no way for you to find your friends unless they send you a link explicitly, right? And there is no way to solve this, at least to my knowledge, in decentralized manner. So the only solution to this is to introduce a search engine that would index all of those distributed things in centralized manner and then have a centralized search engine. And I, it's like, okay, we're back to NPM basically, aside from the fact that we now have multiple registries and you can never be sure if some of them are reliable enough, you know? I really like the premise of federated and distributed and peer-to-peer -peer web and services, but there is so many problems around that. I am not convinced it's gonna fly. But I'm, anyway, I'm gonna track it and I'm still fascinated to see how it will work out. But it's just my two cents essentially. Okay, um, that was quite a rant. <laughs> if you guys have any other questions, let me just pour some uh, cola to myself. Otherwise I'm gonna go, uh, <clears throat> gonna have problems speaking in a couple of minutes. So I'm out of questions. So if you got, uh, um, let me try this again. I'm out of questions. So if you guys have anything else you wanna ask, Feel free to send them right now into the chat. Um, if not, uh, I guess we could wrap it up here. It's been almost an hour. And uh, yeah, we could just uh, do do more stuff over the weekend, I guess. So there's gonna be BXGS Weekly tomorrow, obviously. And uh, I think I've got uh, two new games in my library so we can play some video games, maybe even today, I don't know. But let's see. So guys, any more questions, any more things you want to ask me? Again, ask me anything. It doesn't have to be technical. It can be about my life, my cats. I don't know anything you might think. My startups, like I failed um, seven startups in my life. So yes, I have three cats, man. I can go and try to find them and catch them, but um, it's likely not going to go well. <laughs> They just have had food before the stream, so they are, uh, yeah. Uh, we have two cats. That's nice. We had two cats until two years ago, and then we took another small one. So we have a third one that just basically runs around and bites their asses. The older ones are like nine years old, so they are not very happy about that. <laughs> Over 12 years. Oh, that's some old cats. Nice. Cool. Mildly allergic to them after 12 years. That's an interesting twist. Okay. Your last startup, how does it work? Um, it's, it's been an insane ride and I'm still planning to do that last video for summing it up, but there's still some things in motion and I basically don't want to jinx it, but it's like, it's there's still progress and we should get the final news on it in the next week or two. And after that, I basically gonna, um, yeah, gonna do either a video or a stream where I'll be talking about that. But it's, it's been insane. We took them with us all over Europe from Romania to Barcelona to Dublin and back to Romania. That is quite a trip for the cats. <laughs> so, oh, you lived in Barcelona. Tell me, how do you like it there? I've, I've visited f like twice, I think, for a couple of weeks, but... There is a chance that I'm going to move there to live there as well, but uh, I'm very curious for how long did you live in Barcelona and how did you like it? Uh, Iasi, Romania. I've never been to Romania. I should visit sometime. That sounds like a fun country. Two years. So tell what, what did you like Barcelona? What did you not like about there? Uh, blah, about there? I'm terrible at English today. <laughs> Damn it. 30 kilometers from border of Republic Moldova. Nice. Okay, man, I've like I've been living in Europe for seven years, I think. And so far I've been like in, in Finland, I've been obviously in Germany, I've been in Greece, and I've been uh where else I've been? I've been oh yeah, I've been in obviously Spain and I've been in Italy, I think. That's it. Like five countries. I should travel more, man. I need to visit all those, like Romania and... Oh, no, wait, I'm, I've been in Czech Republic as well in Prague. That was also quite fun. I really want to just take some time off and travel around the Europe and see all those other countries that I've never been to. This is just absolutely fascinating every time I go there and like, whoa. 
Barcelona is nice enough, but you need to know the language. Locals can speak English to say, I mean, <laughs> man, you're telling this to a guy who lives in Germany in a pretty small city. Nobody speaks English in here ever. Like when I just came here and I couldn't speak a bit of, it, if, uh, of German, I tried speaking in English to majority of people. And it's like, if they are older than 20 years, they cannot say a word. Yeah, you have higher chances to talk to them in Russian, actually. So I used to speak in gestures and mommy like, oh, oh, give me that, basically. It was terrible. But uh, yes, I mean, Spanish, uh, as far as I know, Spanish is not that hard to uh, learn, right? So that should not be a problem. I figured out how to speak German in the end, at least on a basic level, so it should be fine. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, can relate to the locals not speak. I, I think like if you want locals to speak English, it's better to go to the English speaking country, to be honest. Because of, what was it? Yeah, in fi fi yeah, I think Finland was the only country where they were really good at English. But I think it was because they show all the movies in English with Finnish subtitles. So like majority of Finns actually speak decent English or at least can understand you, which was pretty mind blowing, to be honest, especially after Germany. Uh, one year of intensive German in fifth grade. I mean, I had f three or four years of German in, in school. So it was like from fifth grade to ninth grade. What was it? Yeah, four years. And I've actually spoken. So we had like a proper conversation in it by the end of the ninth uh, grade. But then, then I came to Germany like 10 years later and I didn't remember anything. <laughs> Having something at school does not guarantee you will remember anything. <laughs> oh, Romania also has the subtitles. That's interesting. Like this, I really like this approach. This is like very interesting. I think this changes the way that you perceive the movies. Uh, yeah, and it, like as you know, as I said, I I saw the effect of this in Finland because. Even the oldest people that I would never expect to understand me when I talked English to them, like they couldn't reply, but they knew exactly what I was saying, which was amazing. So they just answered with, in Finnish and with gestures, but you know, we figured it out and they actually understood what I was asking, which was mind blowing. And I think, yeah, the movies with the subtitles are basically uh, there to thank for that. So it's kind of, kind of awesome that this exists. I miss the movies in English in Germany because the, uh, like at least in Leipzig, it's a relatively smallish town, you know, and uh, like rarely you find the people who speak English. This majority of them are either like transfer students or uh, people working in academia, essentially because the English is the language for academia. Uh, but yeah, it's like in, in cinemas, you don't get English movies unless they are like blockbusters that they know a lot of people will come to watch. You always get like the German dubs, which are... I don't know, they are so bad. They are just as bad as the Russian dubs, basically. <laughs> in Thailand, we dubbed everything. Yeah, same for Russia. Russia has dubbed movies for everything and most of the time it's just really bad. Like the Russian voice actors are... I mean, there are some good ones, but majority of them are just terrible. <laughs> um, before 89, Romanian national TV had two hours of broadcast every day. So we had another antenna and we were tuning into Moldovian TV where they had a lot of Russian movies. Voice dubbed in Romanian. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> I think a lot of countries actually dub everything. So that's not exclusive to Thailand or again, Russia, you know, it's like Germans dub everything as well. It's like they have separate screenings for movies in English, which is, yeah, again, you know, in our tiny town, it's not okay. Tiny. I'm saying tiny was not that small, but anyway, it's not that frequent that they have like English movies with subtitles is most of, I don't think, wait, they don't actually have subtitles. It's just English movies. So they have the original uh, movies sometimes with subtitles in German, but that's like very rare. And this is usually for like really, really big movies, like, you know, the Avengers Endgame or something. And then if you want to watch something more niche, it's highly unlikely you will find it in English. This is why I'm generally waiting for the DVD releases and just like rent them on Amazon or whatever. <laughs> Um, they had a great set of actors during voice dubbing. I had the option recently to compare original Russian version and Romanian version. And the voice acting was amazing. Okay, that's actually really awesome. Like we used to have, like Russia used to have really cool actors back in the you know 80s, 90s. But then it slowly fell apart. And ugh, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, they still have some really good actors. 
mm -mm, apologies right now, but it's just in my country, Indonesia, they censor Sandy bikini in spot. Wait, what? <laughs> um, okay, okay, then. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, this is the. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is the Christmas movie that they show in Russia, basically. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Every Christmas, every New Year, they show this stuff before the New Year on like 31st of uh, December, usually. And everyone, it's an amazing movie. Like, it's really great. Dubbing is outstanding. Okay, I see, that's it. I never actually thought that they dubbed it and released it anywhere in the West. That's interesting. I always assumed it was like very niche Russian movie that was really good, but nobody ever saw it outside of Russia, but I might be as well mistaken. 8.5 on IMDb, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, it is a great movie, but this is interesting. And it was even released in East Germany. Fascinating. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. All right. Moldova was a part of USSR at the time. You are absolutely right. I completely forgot about that. Right. Uh, yeah, Manta Putra, if you find... I... <laughs> Honestly, I'm curious if it was ever translated to English. You can actually what Age of Pirates 2, gentlemen. <laughs> what is that? No, that is not what we want. Um, I wonder if you can actually... Can you... That seems like a full movie on, on YouTube. Yep, that's a full movie on YouTube. <laughs> and it's actually official. Holy crap. You can watch it on YouTube officially. And I'm, I imagine they have a closed captions for that. Now, this is kind of awesome. I, do, <laughs> I imagine if I do auto translation, it's probably going to be terrible. Or is it official? This, they even have official subtitles. Holy shit. This is really cool. Like, I did not know. Like, I, know, I knew that the Moss Film has the YouTube channel. But I only heard that they published the cartoons there. But they actually published the movies too. Holy crap. You can actually watch the old Soviet movies on YouTube for free, even with official subtitles. This is quite a discovery. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, we can, yeah, I, I guess I could just share the link here in the chat because why not for anyone interested? This is, this is kind of crazy. Like you can officially watch it on YouTube, the whole f freaking movie with official subtitles in one, two, three, four, five languages. This is insane. Okay, this is really cool. All right. <clears throat> but okay, movies aside. Do you guys have any other questions you want to talk about? Or um, should we wrap the stream up here and uh, go play Path of Exile? <laughs> is the most important question of the evening. I have been playing a bit too much Path of Exile lately. It is, it is a bit too good. The new league is freaking amazing. Okay. All right, so you guys, I will give you a couple more minutes to uh, send your questions. Hey, Andre, welcome to the stream. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Um, Otherwise, as usual, you will be able to find out the VOD for this uh, live stream on Twitch immediately or on YouTube after I re-upload it there. Oh, hey, cat. So who wanted to see the cats? Uh, there we go. <laughs> he's here. This is our youngest guy. His name is Kumo. He's adorable, but he's also a terrible asshole. Do you like C Sharp? I do like C Sharp. I used to write it for two or three years, but that was a couple of years ago. No, not all cats are assholes. Absolutely not. So our older cats are um, way more nicer, let me put it this way, than this one. So this guy always tries to do some nasty stuff. And I think our older cats are always trying to stop him from doing that. <laughs> um, why is R important? Uh, R is important because it makes it very easy to do statistical stuff. At least this is my understanding of it. I actually never written it myself, but I have a bunch of colleagues who used it to do work on data sets and it was extremely easy for them to do pretty complex 
or to answer pretty complex statistical questions or you know like data analysis questions with R and it looks more like writing uh, math formulas than anything else to be honest. Uh, so I guess I would say it's important for data science and for data analysis. I'm not sure if you can any actually do anything else with it because I, I had like I never used it so I have zero experience with it. Dogs have masters and cats have servants. Uh, no, I don't agree. I think cats are also very, I mean, they're way more independent than dogs, sure, but they are not, I wouldn't say that they are like, you know, serve me. They are more social. Oh God, I, this stuff is too loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for the follow, Andre. Uh, do you think game making languages are good? Uh, what do you mean by game making languages? You can't use them for anything else, but um, like majority of game engines, at least as far as I'm aware, use general programming languages. Like the Unity uses the C Sharp and uh, what was it? Game Maker uses JavaScript, I think, or maybe they have their own script. Um, what was it? Game Maker, uh, which I remember I read about them. Godot, oh, I mean, Godot scripts. Uh, Godot is the Godot engine, right? I guess, like, the thing is, is, um, da -da 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 -da, high level. it uses a syntax similar to Python, you know, used Lua engine. Cat, what are you doing? Stop eating my microphone. So here's the thing. It's like, um, those, the in-engine scripts, they are usually not there to write the whole game, right? It's like the engine provides you enough primitives and, um, enough abstract uh, abstractions for you to basically build the whole game of the engine and the script is there to help you extend it in the ways that you need so if you think that this is not going to be enough for you then you're probably better off writing your own engine which is quite an endeavor on its own but uh yeah no, actually you can do it. I mean, obviously you can do it because it gives you access to the whole internals of the uh, engine, right? But this is not uh, the intended purpose. Let's just put it this way. So like the gaming scripts are there to extend stuff, not to reinvent your own things. Although you can do this, obviously. If you think that Godot engine, for example, fits your purpose and you know that you will... Uh, it's the preferred, I mean, it's the preferred language for the Godot, right? It's not like they, they force you to use the Godot engine. This is what I'm saying. So if you know that the Godot engine will fit your purpose, if you know that you can achieve your stuff with it, so yeah, sure, use Godot script. If not, then I, like, what is it written in? I think Godot engine was like Python or something, if I remember correctly. No, it was C++ actually, I'm mistaking it with something. You can as well just fork the engine and extend it with C++ if you want to, right? So this is also an option as usual. It's like the question is how, how, how deep do you want to go? How low level do you want to go into the engine, right? It's not like you cannot take the source code and extend it using C++. It's just more convenient to use the scripting measures that they provide because they are simpler. That's the thing. And... Uh, as to why they decided to make their own language, it's a very good question. I remember that Godot used, okay, yeah, there you go. In the early days, they used the Lua, but Lua creating bindings to object-oriented system was, con okay, so they basically, the bindings was the problem for them. Uh, Python was difficult to embed, which is it's quite of infamous for. Uh, da -da -da, squirrel, Godot. Okay, so they basically tried a bunch of approaches and nothing worked for them, damn it. Uh, no, I am not German, although I'm living in Germany and I do know, um, well, basic level of German, let's put it this way. Um, okay, but this is interesting. So they actually outline uh, in the history section here, they explain quite nicely why exactly they came up with their own language which makes perfect sense but it's also quite quite fascinating they would actually need something like this so interesting okay <laughs> but again you know i am very far away from game development so i'm probably not the best um can you time me out for five seconds what do you mean time me out oh no oh timeout i what does this do actually Nine messages was deleted. What? What? 
Oh, wait, what, what did I just do? Oh no. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I never worked with um, stream chat. So let me try to figure out what did I just do and how do I undo this? Um, um, that was a mistake. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Um, moderation settings. You kicked him for 10 minutes. Uh, okay, slash unban. Let's try that. <laughs> that was, uh, okay. Um, what was the name? Unban. What was his name? Matt says, there we go. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I <laughs> I'm really good at Twitch, as you can see, you know, really professional streamer. Um, <laughs> thank you, Andrea, for the slash unban help. <laughs> Oh man, I should not try to press buttons. I don't know what they do. Um, okay, Andre, do you like Lua? I've actually never worked with Lua. So I I think I had like one and... Oh yeah, no, I'm lying. I tried it once when I written my own custom add-on for World of Warcraft. But it was literally like super simple. And yeah, it was an okay language. Like I did, you know, again, I didn't have like a ton of experience with it. But it was fine. Sorry, Matzeh, I <laughs> didn't know what this button does. You said, could I time out you? I pressed time out button. What do you want? <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> that did not go the way I thought it would. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that totally did not go the way I thought. Okay, then. Um... Right, do you guys have any other questions or requests to press <laughs> things? Do you like React? Yes, absolutely. I think React is absolutely awesome. And this is my front end framework of choice for the past three years, four years, I guess, along with Next.js, it is kind of great. And in fact, the website that you're seeing on the screen right now, bxjs.dev is written in React. Although in this case, React is not really needed to make it look like it does because it's terrible, but uh, Yes, React is super nice. Um, I got a ton of notifications, okay. Every 60 seconds, no, there is not. The last new framework for JavaScript we had with Vue.js and that was in 2014. Um, yes, it wasn't, so it was five years ago. So at least for five years, there was nothing new in JavaScript. So this is straight up lies. I'm I, I'm a bit tired of like I know that some people joke about that, but I'm tired of people who take those jokes seriously and be like, oh, JavaScript is impossible to keep up with because there's frameworks every five minutes. Well, there was a time when there was like React and then Vue and then Angular and all of them came out pretty much in like span of two years, I think, and people were overwhelmed because all three were really different and people were going crazy. And I get it. Yes, this could be overwhelming, but like last five years has been very stable and very calm actually. I have no idea how to get into JavaScript. There are too many frameworks. Just pick one, like it's, or learn, yeah, learn vanilla JS. This is usually the best way. Just write JavaScript without any frameworks. This is kind of the easiest way to go. People jump straight into, yeah, I mean, jumping straight into frameworks might be a problem. Like it's, you can start with a framework. There's nothing wrong with it. Just be ready that you would have to go back to fundamentals to actually figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> Again, you know, there's nothing wrong with starting with a framework. If you see a framework you like, just pick it and try to use it. That's like, you're going to be fine. Just be ready to learn the vanilla JavaScript because like, for example, React is very heavily dependent on knowledge of JavaScript itself for things like, you know, iteration and filtering and everything like this in the JSX because it's basically just JavaScript in there. And uh, yeah, this would require some additional reading essentially. But yeah, if you want to make apps to Electron JS, Electron is nice, but um, these days I would say, depending on the app, you could even go with progressive app apps. So it's not like you're required to do Electron. I would say that actually majority of cases you don't need it anymore because it's like you have access to almost all the things you need now from the browser. And if you go progressive app app, you can even have offline work and everything and, you know, launch in a window. Like, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm running Discord right now as a window and this is a progress. So this is not a Discord client. This is actually a Chrome and this is my, you know, Chrome menu here. And there's an uninstall button here. 
and that does not eat as much memory as Electron does. So um, yeah, I, I would say progressive web apps are, should be your starting point. Let's just put it this way. And if you feel like there's something missing and you need Electron, then go to Electron. This would be my uh, suggestion basically. All right. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, Andre Matzek, since you are just joined the channel, we have this super nice Discord server. So if you have any questions uh, about JavaScript when you're discovering frameworks or learning them, do join our Discord server. I'm typically there, and there's a bunch of other guys who will be more than happy to help you and uh, point you in the right direction with your problems. I uh, know I I'm. <laughs> My, so my, I, I'm really bad at Twitch, so I don't have any bots. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be the bot, you know, so I'm going to be, it's a, it's a very advanced Tim bot that will uh, do the things for you. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. All right. I probably should update the website because those times are completely wrong right now, but uh, okay. <laughs> okay, guys, any more questions or should we wrap it up here for today? What do you guys think? Have any anything else you want to ask me, or uh, is that is that gonna be it? We have been streaming quite a bit over one hour that I've basically planned, but you know what has been quite fun. <laughs> All right, doesn't I guess doesn't seem like there's any more questions. So um, yeah, I guess we can wrap it up here. That was what is the best? You are the best. <laughs> Hacker language. Um, I mean, that's obviously assembly, right? <laughs> it's not even a question. Assembly is the best language because it's the lowest level. And if you go even lower, then you can just use the um, electrical impulses to change the ones and zeros in the buses on the motherboard. And then you're going to be super hacker if you can pu pull this off. Totally true. <laughs> but OK. <laughs> OK, enough of this. Um, Right, uh, I was saying, <laughs> I was the last series in my university who did the assembly course. I mean, assembly is hard as hell. I actually, this was one of the first languages I picked up when I was into the hacking and man, it was tough. But it does, it does give you a very in-depth understanding of how this stuff works. Do you know how to code in? Uh, I assume BF means brain fuck, and uh, I <laughs> know the syntax, but no, I will not write it myself. <laughs> not by hand. I have the BF transpiler, you know, I can put in my JavaScript and get the brain fuck back. Works perfectly fine. They stripped the lab after we were done. Oh shit, okay, that is, that is tough. Hey programmer, welcome to the stream. Um, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm sticking around a bit more. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. We can chat a bit more. I will pour some more cola to myself. Cat is not happy about me doing that. <laughs> My cats are surprisingly afraid of soda and the uh, bubbles. What? Too much bubbles? Brrr. Yes. Okay. So any more questions, guys? What, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can you pay if you teach me React.js? Um, I mean, I have the free courses for React.js. So if you want, you can just look at them first. And if that is still, uh, okay. Um, I have a YouTube channel with a ton of stuff on it, including a full stack course in JavaScript that is called building products with JavaScript. And it includes React, and you can have a look at that. And if you still think that it is not good enough for you, then you can just come to our Discord server and, uh, yeah, see, uh, talk to me, and we'll figure something else. But I think there's enough free resources to just, you know, uh, learn yourself. Essentially, I don't think. I mean, I guess we could do paid mentoring, but I don't think it's basically worth it to be honest. So, but yeah, just, just try watching the videos first and see if that helps. And uh, if not, then come join the Discord server and uh, ask me again. How do you think the future of PHP? 
I think it's gonna be fine. Like PHP is not going anywhere anytime soon. It's a pretty good language and they've been developing it quite significantly. I mean, I haven't been tracking it too much, but I do see the, I mean, since, you know, the last time I've used it was in 2013, I think, or maybe even 12, but uh, no, yes, it was definitely 2012. Uh, but it's not going anywhere and they are keep like releasing new versions that add some new nice features. It looks quite okay. So if you're, if you are working on PHP and if you are thinking if, you know, if you're going to go out of job in the near future, then you're likely won't. It's not going anywhere. At least this is my perception of it. There might be less vac uh, vacancies with it because of the overwhelming presence of uh, Node.js JavaScript on the market, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I have to get dinner. Nice chatting with you. Yes, thank you for joining the stream and uh, nice chatting with you as well. Enjoy your dinner. Is Ruby still relevant? Absolutely. Ruby is still an awesome language. It still works perfectly fine and there's still a ton of companies that do Ruby and Rails and it works quite well for them. Like the biggest example is probably the um, Bandcamp, right? Oh, no, sorry, not the Bandcamp. God damn. Wait, is it Bandcamp? Yes, Bandcamp. No, wait, not Bandcamp. Bandcamp is for the artists. God damn, what was it? Oh, man. Basecamp is what? <laughs> right. Basecamp is what I'm saying. This is the guys who essentially work on... Um, it's written in Rails, right? And they're using Ruby and... They are extremely popular. They are scaling to millions of users and it works really well for them and they're really happy. So, and uh, the, one of the authors of uh, Rails is working there and yes, Ruby is still fine. I mean, it's really hard to make the language obsolete. Like if you look on the, I, come on, it's really easy to confuse Bandcamp and Basecamp. <laughs> I'm not even sure. Maybe Bandcamp is also using Ruby. Bandcamp, backend. Let's see. If they are using Ruby, then I was correct again. Uh, Ruby Mosh. Yes, they are using Ruby. It seems. Yes. So Bandcamp also uses Ruby. So that was valid. That was valid anyway. <laughs> Cat, what are you? What are you doing? What's happening? Okay. Um. But yeah, again, as I said, you know, it's really hard to make a programming language obsolete. Like if you look around, you will see that there are still stuff written in COBOL and the COBOL developers are valued very highly right now because there's not that many of them. So yeah, it's Ruby's fine. I mean, Perl is fine. Perl is still great. Perl is an amazing language and they released a new version that looks freaking amazing. But there's probably like, you know, a, not that many people writing it because it's quite niche cat stop what are you <laughs> what are you doing you little asshole <laughs> no he's trying to lie down on my keyboard yes you can lie down over there all right any more questions guys i mean i might at this point i feel like i might just launch the path of exile and continue playing and answering your questions <laughs> but Okay, uh, <clears throat> all right, I think we might as well wrap it up here for today, so. Okay, so yeah, let's just, let's just wrap it up. Uh, I think my cat wants something from me, so I'm gonna go play with him, I guess. So, uh, once again, thank you guys very much for joining me and asking all your questions. It was quite fun. We probably should do those streams a bit more frequently. If you missed the stream or parts of it, the VOD will be available on Twitch immediately or on YouTube after I upload it there. So in a couple of hours, I guess. If you have more questions, uh, you can always join our Discord chat and ask me there. Um, that's basically all I have for you for today. There's going to be um, the XS Weekly podcast stream tomorrow as usual. Not at 20, but it's actually 13, 14. Not sure yet. Uh, so as usual during the day. And uh, maybe I'll stream some video games over the Sunday or maybe tomorrow evening. We'll see how that goes. So thank you guys very much for joining me for today. Thank you for your questions and your continued support. Have a great uh, Friday evening and I see you next time. Bye.